in the United States this week, it's Thanksgiving week, which is, and for as long as I have been on this planet, has always been the most traveled week of the year. Planes, trains, automobiles, probably a kayak or two, everybody piling into whatever method of conveyance gets them back to their family so they can celebrate the giving of thanks. And so I thought it might be appropriate to try a travel log style episode of Reasonably Sound. Like countless other people, I'm also traveling home for Thanksgiving, though in this specific instance of travel, I don't end up home at my parents' house, but rather in a hotel room. So the details are not strictly isomorphic. Either way, I thought it might be fun to talk about the sounds of the weird transitory spaces we inhabit as we trek across whatever distances. And I thought it might be fun to do it with the technology available in those places. Phones, computers, an iPod, nothing fancy. In transit audio. Liminal sound. So that's what this is. Unscripted, very lightly edited, inspired by the location of the recording. Sound thoughts from sound places, very much inspired by Hank and John Green, the Vlogbrothers on YouTube, their video series, Thoughts from Places, to which I will include a link in the show notes so you can see it if you haven't ever. So I'll see you on the other end, mostly just to say bye. We'll see if any patterns develop in what I'm about to do. Maybe. For now, let's just get this show on the road. I'm about to start traveling, and I thought it might be really interesting to talk. About Turn right onto Wood Avenue. What? Continue on Wood Avenue for a half mile. It sounds like in the different places that we hang out in and inhabit when we do travel. I'm starting right now in my car. Whenever I'm driving, I'm always really curious about what it's like inside other people's cars. I mean, I'm curious about all kinds of things about what it's like inside of other people's cars. Like, um, people who have really immaculately clean cars are such a character to me. I know so few people who own cars that are clean that when I just happen to peer into someone's car and it's clean, it's like, oh, I feel like I maybe know what kind of person you are. I also find it really interesting when people have a lot of air fresheners, a collection of air fresheners. Because that, to me, signals that the smell of their car is something that's really important to them. And that's something that I almost never think of. I, I mean, I guess I, I think about it when my car smells really bad for some reason. But I don't ever think of editing the scent of my car so that it is more generally pleasurable. But of course, the thing I am the most interested in is what someone's car sounds like, what the inside of their vehicle, what sounds it's making, or what sounds they are experiencing. I think one, one of my favorite things to see when I'm driving on the streets in New York is someone who is listening to music in traffic, uh, in just dead traffic and they are having the best time. They're dancing and singing along and just going for it as if they are on stage, but they are in their car. And I think that there is this performative aspect of driving that, I mean, you, you sort of perform the actions of the vehicle itself, the really, the really huge metal suit that you are wearing, but you're in a glass box of some kind. And I think that for some people, the, the the folks that they are stuck in traffic with are kind of their audience and that they get to provide a little bit of a little bit of a show for them in some way or another. I think a lot of people ride the subway like this too. They think, oh, like here's here's a captive audience and they get to be the center of attention for an amount of time. Um, I will say that I think the mystery dies a little bit when someone is singing along and partying to in 800 feet. Turn left onto Myrtle Avenue. To a song that you can really clearly hear because they have it cranked up so loud that it's it's emanating from. Turn their car. left onto Myrtle Avenue. 
that it's it's emanating from their car or that they have their windows rolled down or something. I, I much rather see them having such a good time and having it in a funny kind of private way where you you have to guess what it is that they're listening to or if you really want to be a creeper you can just try to read their lips look at them long enough to figure out that they're singing along to a prince song or um you know anaconda by Nicki minaj the other thing that I always find really interesting is seeing people having conversations, talking to themselves. Um, you know, there's no one else in the car, there's just one person, but they're talking really casually. I'm always really curious about what kind of conversation they're having, who they might be talking to, whether or not it's business or family. Uh, this is a question or a wonder that I have frequently Continue on Myrtle Avenue for a half mile When I am in a car service Because so often car services are driven by um, people, almost always men, who speak a language that I don't And they seem, there, there are drivers that seem to just always be on the phone That, that however long their shift is and if what I have learned anecdotally, f just from uh, having taken a bunch of car services in my life, shifts are not short, that for, the, for these whole long shifts, these men are just on the phone. Maybe with their significant others, maybe with their family, maybe with their friends, I don't know. And I'm always really curious to know what they're talking about. What, I, I would struggle to fill maybe five hours of conversation on the phone if I were to call every single person who would be willing to have an extended phone call with me. Like, I don't think I know five people who would have an hour-long conversation with me, let alone fill an entire shift driving a car service. And so when I see people talking in their car by themselves, it, I always wonder, you know, if it is if it is a phone call that they're making. And, and if it is, if it's if it's the middle part of this long and sprawling conversation that they're having, um, probably about things that just get their mind off of the fact that they're driving. It's, I'm, I'm probably really overthinking this. Let's Turn right onto Marcy Avenue. Let's be honest, that really it probably is just these people trying to get their mind off the fact that they are driving or have to drive for any extended amount of time and that the conversation is not some sort of crazy in-depth thing it's probably just them being with their friends being with their family in some respect that because of their location or their job they're not they're not able to but there's also there's also this aspect of people talking on the phone in their cars that relates to the thing that I like about seeing people celebrate their music in their cars which is which is the performative aspect of it that you know I, I don't I don't mean to say that when someone is having a clear argument via their hands-free phone or on their Bluetooth in their car that I enjoy that because you know I don't want to wish an argument on someone but there's something in about a quarter mile slight left to stay on Marcy Avenue but there's something about the alone the solitude of having a, having an argument via a telephone in a car surrounded by other cars that again it has this strange performative aspect to it it's like when you walk by someone on the street and they're having a really serious phone call and they're very upset you get you get one side of it and I, for some reason I can't ever help but just side with that person that it's, I just, I just always think like, yeah, you're probably right. You tell them that you're not gonna work if they don't pay you, because that's unfair. Uh, or, you know, like, yeah, Cindy was awful last night, wasn't she? How dare she? Um, and that when I see someone in a car and, and they're, they're gesticulating and clearly upset that I think like, yeah, you, t you tell them how it is. You tell them how it is. But then when that person starts driving like a jerk or honking wildly, I think like, okay, you might just actually be an angry person.
right left onto Central Terminal Drive. So everyone knew where this area was and yeah, and there who were, lived there? Yeah, and it was like a lot of um, hair salons that were doubled as brothels. Okay, and you find them in New York as well, in New York's Chinatown. There are these hair salons that don't seem quite beautiful and don't seem to be Right, and there's a little curtain at the back. Time to get on a plane. I don't know if it's just me, but there's something about the setting of the airport that makes every phone call placed within it seem really important. That, that I don't know, I've never actually said this out loud, so I, I am fully aware of the fact that this might be something that makes no sense and that no one else thinks, but whenever I see someone in an airport on the phone, it just always strikes me that they are probably having a very important conversation. I think part of it might have to do with the fact that when you're at the airport, the main or, or one of the major modes of communication that the airlines and um, its employees have with communicating with you is it's, it's auditory. I mean, there are signs and televisions that tell you if gates have been changed, if things are delayed, um, but the actual boarding process is done via those intercoms, via the, you know, like, gate-wide address system that they have. And that always happens first, before any of the televisions get updated. And so, it, it just always seems like it's something that you, you want to pay attention. You want to be able to hear whatever announcement is being made because that's such a part of being at the airport, of traveling, is what kind of announcement is being made over the intercom. And when I see someone on the phone, I don't know, I just, maybe this is, this is my own anxiety with travel, like wanting to know exactly what's happening at every moment and wanting to pay attention and wanting to have some sense of control in a situation where it's futile to expect such a thing to exist. Um, but whenever I see someone on the phone, I think, oh no, you can't, you, that must be important because you're not going to be able to hear whatever, excuse me, whatever announcement is going to get made related to what you're doing. You know, get, get, finish that up real quick, that phone call that you absolutely have to make, and start paying attention to the the warring announcements happening over the intercom system. And I think that's, that's the other thing, too, is that it, de it depends upon the airport, but if there's always this battle between the different gates and their gate agents trying to make announcements for their passengers. Um, in, so, in, a, in a way that a lot of times strikes me as comical, um, you know, like I've I've seen gate agents give each other dirty looks because one of them was able to get an announcement in before the other one. You know, like they're sort of racing for control over the intercom. Um, or, you know, um, I saw two gate agents once um, exchange words with one another because one of them seemed always to be making announcements at the same time as the other one. And so there was just this cacophony of voices coming out of the intercoms. It seems like there's a real... There's a real, like, power struggle happening um, in certain, certain um, gates, certain, certain parts of airports where the gate agents know that, that, you know, this is how they're communicating with their customers and, you know, I guess that the customer service experience is in some way um, impacted by how clearly customers can hear things, and so there's a there's a power struggle for the airwaves, for the for the auditory space that exists at the gate when people are waiting. You know,
This is maybe also another reason why I find the presence of televisions at airport gates to be such a kind of violent thing. That there's already so much overlapping communication happening between the airport-wide announcements, um, people having lost objects, people m missing flights, uh, airlines trying to find passengers, people making boarding announcements, um, just the general din that is created by a mass of humanity, and then on top of that you're going to add Greta Van Susteren? I don't, like... It just, I understand the motivation for it is that it's, I'm sure there's some advertising, um, there's some economic reason that I have to watch HLN whenever I'm waiting to f get, on an air get on an airplane. Anyway, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I, I don't see the airport phone call as having, or uh, as being the same type of phone call as um, the stuck in a car phone call, that there is something about them that seems fundamentally different. Um, I guess the, the, the difference, um, or the exception being if you have a really long layover and, and nothing to do, and, you know, you want to connect, spend some time with your family or your friends while you are just hanging out in an airport for hours and hours and hours at a time, but still, there is this zone of both time and space in front of the gate that seems to suggest you know, one should abandon all additional auditory activities. It's, you know, you have to take out your earphones, you have to hang up your phone. There is a set of things that you have to pay attention to for this, for this part of your life, because it's, it, it's like 20 square feet of Thunderdome when it, everybody's getting ready to board the plane. That, that it's just the tension gets very high very quickly and there's all this crowding and people getting frustrated with other people if they don't walk quickly enough or don't have their boarding passes ready and all of these announcements are vying against one another and the air is just full of just full of announcement and full of information I don't know, it stresses me out I guess that's what we're talking about and speaking of which, now that I've been here talking to myself like a weirdo for the last number of minutes, it looks like it's time for me to get onto an actual plane. So um, I'll, I'll be back in a few minutes. Hello, good, how are you? Ladies and gentlemen, Small, lightweight electronic devices may be used for all phases of flight in airplane mode. Larger electronic devices, such as full-size laptops, must be stowed for departure. Please place your seat back in the upright position, stow your tray table, and fasten your seat belt. The sound on the airplane, like most other things on the airplane, is claustrophobic, is maybe the word. You have the sound of the this tube hurtling through the air, you know, like we talked about a little bit in the Cadillacs of Quiet episode, that there's just this general din of noise that sort of masks everything else that's happening around you. and. You know, the thing that I always think about when I'm on an airplane is the, the TARDIS um, the, uh, from Doctor Who. Uh, for anybody who doesn't watch Doctor Who, um, the Doctor has uh, a spaceship that looks on the outside like a police call box, this blue wooden call box. And, you know, it, it looks like it's about maybe seven or eight feet tall and four foot by four foot uh, cube, you know, or rectangle thing. Um, but when you walk in, it's a massive spaceship. Uh, it's, it is, in the parlance of the show, bigger on the inside. And I always think about this when I am on an airplane listening to music or watching a movie, that that is sort of what you're doing, that the, the distraction of those things, the distraction of putting in headphones and inhabiting another space is kind of like making the claustrophobic space, the, oppre the oppressive audio environment that you're stuck in, in this metal tube, bigger on the inside. 
you're counteracting the proximity that you have with other people and with constant noise and all of this interaction by diving into something that gives you at least a sense of elbow room or breathing space. Um, you know, whenever, whenever I listen to music on an airplane, I go one of two routes, which is I will listen to something that is like the airplane, but different, so something that is constant and drony as a way to sort of, I don't know, fight it? Like, I think that's my... That's, it's like a, um, you know, fighting fire with fire mentality. Um, but then a lot of times I'll try to listen to something that is that is big and, and um, spacious, I guess is the word, uh, to try to recapture some of that sense that I have, I have room to myself, I have space. I think this is, you know, this is one of the things that, we, that will probably come up again and again on this podcast is, is how one's personal experience of sound, especially when it's in headphones, in shifting environments, it really does create personal space, that you are, you're creating a personal space for you to inhabit, and I think that the carving out of that space, you know, on, on an airplane is a very, very powerful thing, as evidenced by the set of technologies designed to do exactly that. And then, of course, there's the whole other set of audio experiences that come with um, being crammed in the same small space with a bunch of other human beings. I always find it really, um, I don't know, uh, en endearing is maybe the word, um, when, you know, you sit down next to someone um, on the airplane and they haven't had lunch or whatever, and so you can actually hear their stomach growling, um, or you know, you, you listen to the tail end of conversations that people are having as the, the flight attendants are walking around trying to get everybody to turn their laptops and cell phones off um, so that the plane can take off. You know, when you hear them say goodbye to their business partners or their loved ones, um, and you get this little glimpse into, into these people um, from, you know, from, from the stuff that you can hear because you are you are in such close proximity to one another. Which, um, yeah, my seatmates have now listened to me babble on and on about the sound of a plane long enough, so I'm going to zip my lip for the rest of this flight. Um, I'll, um, you'll, uh, the next time you hear me, I will have arrived at my final destination. My feeling has always been that hotel rooms are supposed to be some kind of safe zone. It's kind of like coming through the door is a little bit like going through an airlock. You know, you enter into this space where anything is allowed, uh, or I guess anything within reason. I mean, I think this is, right, this is why all of the, there's all of this Myth, mythos, mythology around hotel rooms and people trashing them. It's, you know, it's the place where you can do that. None of the stuff is yours. None of the responsibility is yours, and so you can just... You can just destroy it. And I think that, that one of the promises of a hotel room is always that it's quiet. That even though it's almost always packed inside of a building where there are, you know, dozens, if not hundreds, if not a thousand people living so close to one another, um, that it's, it's still going to be a little bit of an, an oasis or, a, um, a, uh, it provides some respite in some way that when you do close your hotel room door, you're going to shut off all of the rest of the sound that's happening around you.
Last night, actually, I was. It was about four o'clock in the morning, and someone started knocking on my door and trying to get in using a, using their key card, uh, and I shot out of bed, sort of half asleep. Said said something, you know, yeah, or go away, or no. Um, and then they realized what they were doing. Went around to, it sounded like a bunch of other rooms, knocking on all of the doors very loudly until they got to the one directly above mine. And what followed was just this, like, scuffle, skirmish? It, it sounded like it could have been a, a wrestling match. I don't know if it was a fist fight. I don't know what happened. But there was definitely some kind of physical altercation that occurred. And I just remember thinking in my half-asleep state, no, you, what are you doing? This is not what hotels are for. Hotels aren't for making lots of noise. Hotels are for me being in my room and not being able to hear anything and being safe from the outside world and that nothing should be able to intrude and that the, the intrusion of this altercation above my hotel room was just unforgivable. Forget about the safety of the people involved and forget about whatever situation that I'm sure was not great led to that happening. I was upset that they were being loud. Sometimes you can stay in a hotel that has a doorbell, which I've always found a little strange. It's kind of like, you know, the, the, the metaphor is that it's your home away from home for a little while and, you know, you're gonna, you, they want you to feel at home and you want to be comfortable and, um, but the doorbell seems one step too far to stay in a hotel room that has a doorbell. It's, it's like your hotel room is playing house just a little bit too hard. Like, well, you know, just, it's fine. Knock on the door. You don't need a doorbell. The hotel that I'm staying in right now actually doesn't have a phone. And I think this is the first time I've ever stayed in a hotel without a phone in the room. And I don't know, I mean, I haven't asked the front desk if there's a specific reason for that, but part of me thinks that the reason is a clear one. I remember when the, the first apartment that I ever lived in in New York City um, was in Brooklyn, it was in Crown Heights, and I remember I moved in with some friends of mine. One of them was Dylan Thuris, who was on this podcast in the um, Sound of War episode. And I remember asking Dylan and, and Sam um, and Adam, the other guys that were living there, I was like, oh, and so where's, where's your phone? And they were like, we don't have one or need one. And this was in 2005. And I remember thinking, oh, yeah, we all have phones. Why would you have another one? that would just be overkill. And so maybe the hospitality industry is getting on that boat. This room also doesn't have an alarm clock, which I do find a little weird. I mean, let's be honest. I do always use my phone as the make a sound in the morning so that I wake up device even when I'm on vacation. Because I mean, who, who wants to learn how to program the hotel alarm clock? But it still seems weird to me that there isn't an alarm clock, if only for the time-telling capabilities. Sure enough, when I asked the woman at the front desk about the lack of telephones in the hotel, she gave me a quizzical look and asked, well, don't you have one? She was also very quick to apologize for the skirmish that happened above my room the night before. My name is Mike Regnetta, and this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Instagram and on Twitter, at Reasonably S-N-D. You can find me pretty much everywhere, at Mike Regnetta. If you're outside the United States, I hope you have a pleasant and normal week and Thursday. But if you're inside the United States, happy Thanksgiving. Safe travels. Tell your family that I said hey. And for my part, I am, of course, thankful for you, the people listening to Reasonably Sound. We've had a really good run here, these first nine episodes. So this seems like a particularly appropriate time to just say 
Thank you. Thanks for listening to the show. Thanks for reaching out on Twitter and via email and on Tumblr and all over the place. And for listening to a weird show about sound and for being so complimentary and supportive during its first initial episodes while I'm still trying to figure out what's going on. So, yeah. Thanksgiving. I'm giving thanks. Thank you to everybody listening. Oh, and thanks also to the Infinite Guest Network from American Public Media. Mm-hmm.